so that there's not um, too much feedback. If there are any questions, kindly put it in the chat box and uh, we will address it after his presentation. So Vinay, thank you for your time and uh, uh, please, uh, you can uh, start with your sharing. Thank you. Thank you all, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining it. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very humbled to see that people are, you know, really taking out time on the Sunday evenings and uh, to listen to me and look at my work. Uh, so my name is Vineet Bora. I'm from India. Uh, I've been shooting from past 28 years. Uh, and I happen to be a Leica ambassador also. So uh, I, I'll be showing you images which I've shot uh, from Leica in the last, maybe let's say seven years. Um, so these are three cities. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about these three cities and the cities which I'm showing you. The first one is uh, going to be Varanasi. Uh, that is the oldest living civilization in the world. Uh, I love going to that city and love making pictures over there. Uh, the second one is New Delhi. Uh, now I, I'm going to give you one bonus from New Delhi. I'll be showing you some images in black and white. And I'm also going to be showing you, I've, I've called it my Delhi and those images will be in color. Uh, my reason for giving two aspects of Delhi is that uh, there is, uh, uh, I predominantly shoot in color. Uh, my vision, I see things in color, but there was uh, uh, about two years back, three years back, uh, there's one year which I dedicated my uh, entire year into black and white photography and all thanks to Leica, I got a, a monochrome from Leica and I was just experimenting in black and white. So I wanted to show what uh, Delhi means to me when there is no color. And uh, the third city is Pushkar, which is in Rajasthan. Uh, there, is, there is a kettle fair which happens every year. Uh, I hope it happens this year as well. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you these three cities. All the images you will see, uh, there, it is just my subjective interpretation of the city. Uh, in no way I'm trying to uh, maybe make a political point or uh, raise an agenda about the city. Uh, it is also that house, that city spoke to me. Another thing which I want to add on uh, before I start my presentation, that none of the animals were harmed during taking these pictures. All right, so I'm going to show you the pictures. Uh, why did I say that? Because I love shooting uh, animals and which are street animals. Uh, in, in India, you will see a lot of uh, street animals like dogs, cats. Cats, not that much, but you, uh, you will see cows. Uh, you will also see camels in Rajasthan. Um, I, well, I feel that it is about coexistence. And that is how I share these images with you. All right, so not wasting too much time. I'm going to show you the images. So that's my mail, which is popped up. Sorry. Let's try again. Wait. Just wait a second because sometimes these things just act a little funny. All right. Jacqueline, just give me a heads up that it is full screen now. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet. Oh, you have? Not yet. It Not is? Yet. Not yet. All right. Okay. Wait. Okay. All right. Can you see it full screen now? Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry for all the trouble, guys. Uh, just uh, new to this. A distant learning program. I think everybody is just learning the way I am. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm one person who likes to spend more time in, in the dark room than on light room. So <laughs> technology, I'm, I'm just trying to figure it out. <laughs> All right. So this is, uh, this is Banaras. 
So this was taken on the banks of Banaras. Now, why I took this picture, I saw this, there's, there was a mystery around Banaras. There's always been a mystery. And I felt that this is a big bubble in which the whole Banaras is living in. Uh, there was a kid who was playing with the balloons and also with bubbles, they were making bubbles. And there was a big bubble which kept, which came into my frame. And that's how I took this picture. If you have any questions regarding uh, any of the images, you could just put it uh, in your threads, in the question answer thread, and then you can see it. I don't know why there's a blue cost coming. All right. So this is another one. Is there a blue cost coming on your screen? Now it's better. No, yeah, did not, now it's blue. Just now was better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so wait, let me just share it again. I, All right. Okay, now so this, yeah, but you know, when I'm sharing it, it's just not more than, sorry. Sorry. Just, yeah, all right, sorry. Okay, so this was, this is a fabric which is supposed to be, uh, you know, underwear. So there are, there are people in India who are really, really from the old school and they like to dry their underwears on the banks of Ganges. They wash their clothes and this is a underwear which is also called the langot. So you, he, was, he was just drying it up and it felt like uh, there, was, there was a big snake flowing into the scene. Uh, and that is how sorry. I made this picture. We... Sorry, yeah. We're not able to see your images. Oh, you're not? No. no. Wow. Wait. Okay, can you see now? Yes. yes. Sorry. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. So at any point you feel there is some uh, problem, just let me know. All right. So this is the image I was talking about. This is, this is how it flows in the air when they're drying their underwears, but it created that whole scene. And uh, that is how I took this shot. These are kids who are learning Sanskrit. There is, there is a Vedic school in Varanasi. So these kids, they, at a very early age, they start learning the Vedas, uh, and uh, also the, it, it is also about mythological content which they read. And they were taking a dip. The whole area, the whole Varanasi, it survives on River Ganges, and people like to take a dip. It is very mysterious, and I would invite all of you people who haven't come to India to really go to this place and make these pictures. So this is another thing, which it's a festival which happens in during monsoons where people from all over India, they wear orange or saffron clothes and they visit Varanasi for cultural purpose, for religious purpose. Uh, this city is, it just has so much to offer. It has uh, diversity in culture, people, uh, they're also kids who are going to uh, English medium schools and which are very high level schools and also from really, really old, uh, you know, temples in the world, which are here. 
So all sorts of people, every part of India, they come here and celebrate all these festivals. Is the pace okay of sharing the pictures? Jacqueline? Yes, is yes. It okay? Yeah, I think so. All right, so, yes. all right, so. Everything uh, good. All right, so, so uh, this is what all happens on the bank. So the, there are kids who are playing with kites. They're flying kites. Uh, so these, these kids, they, they are the kids of the boat riders who live there all around the year and ferry people, uh, ferry tourists. And these kids in the evening or during the day, whatever time they have, they try to, uh, you know, involve themselves with, every possible little uh, playful activities and kite flying is one of them. So it is so mysterious. You at times you think that whether Varanasi is for real or not, or people, not only people, uh, they are buffaloes also, which are taking dips. So these guys, they are actually, uh, these buffaloes are pets. And if you'll see the guy on the right, uh, he's washing his, uh, giving a bath to buffaloes. And uh, they, they, in India, we, we pet buffaloes to give milk. And uh, this is what he's trying to, he's trying to uh, clean them. And uh, he tries to keep them as uh, fresh as possible, I would say. And once after they take a dip, they try to uh, dry off their clothes just on the stairs. And then uh, this is this is a very funny shot because on one of the banks, they, they practice yoga. So, and I found these guys, they're taking their tongues out just like a dog. So I took a picture. So this was Varanasi. For me, um, I, you know, I particularly like this shot a lot because uh, there is there is a soul kind of a departing from this guy and getting into banks. Uh, it was just really overwhelming to see this shot when I made it. Uh, Jacqueline, if you have any question regarding any of the shots from Varanasi, I think we should take it up now. Okay. There is no. Yeah, sorry. There's no questions uh, with regards to the image. Just, uh, right. well, actually just came in, sorry. Do you prefer 35 or 28 lens? So all these images which you are seeing, they are shot on 28 mm Sumeron. Uh, I've been okay. shooting with that lens for, yeah, 28 Sumeron. Uh, I've been shooting from past uh, seven years. I think the minute it came out, the newer version, I took it. And I've been shooting on it earlier. Before that, I was I, mean, I was shooting on uh, El Mal. Uh, so 28 is my go-to lens for all the images. Okay. How long do you hang around in one area? Um, so these these shots, there are two types of techniques which I normally work in. Uh, one is hunting, and one is fishing. So if I feel that there is something, if the moment is pregnant, and I have to stick around to make it deliver, then I hang there about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. But I will not spend more than 15 minutes on any scene. Uh, if I feel that this is, this, there is gonna be a shot, then I come back after half an hour or maybe one hour to make that scene happen, uh, but not more than 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, what is the best month to visit Varanasi? So anywhere from, I would say October till March, it's the best time. 
uh, it is October uh, till March. October till March. Uh, generally, what happens is after the monsoons, it gets flooded, and it tends to take about two months for the water, the Ganges, to come down. Um, so uh, October is very good. In November, there is a very big festival which happens in Varanasi, which is called the Dev Dipavli. Uh, it is uh, Diwali for the gods, which happens uh, in November. So it is the best. The best time is November and December, uh, but it can continue till March. November, December, uh, January is the best. The weather is very good. Uh, the light is very good, but you can shoot till from October till March. It's okay. okay. And the last question is, uh, how was the silhouette picture taken? We'll take this the one? questions later. Yes. Uh, are we talking oh, about I this know. one on the screen? Yes. Yes. Sir. All right. So, yeah. So, wh what you are seeing is that the light is the sun is just behind the guy's head. So I've hidden sun behind him and exposed for the highlights, and it's become like this. So normally in situations like this, when the sun is right in front of you, mm -hmm. so you have to position yourself in such a way that the camera doesn't look into the sun straight away. So position yourself in such a way that the sun is hidden and then start exposing for the highlights and you will get these black magic. Okay, thank you. Right, so I'll move on to Delhi. Another question, digital or film shooter? Oh. Uh, for me, um, well, if I have to enjoy the romance of photography, then I shoot film. Uh, I shoot about two, three roles in a year. Uh, but uh, I'm predominantly a digital shooter. Uh, also for the reason, because there are a lot of uh, labs which are shutting down and processing the pictures is not easy. Uh, I used to have a dark room, but not anymore. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also I would suggest that if, uh, if there's something which we, it, it's an offer technolo technologically, then we should accept it. Uh, but uh, what you should do is uh, you can always make yourself feel, if you have that uh, love for films, uh, I use a Leica M10D, which doesn't have a back screen, and I can't review my pictures. So I tend to shoot like that. Uh, I don't like to view the pictures I've shot. Uh, so I, my love is there for film. Uh, but uh, I want the, uh, you know, strength of digital. I want it to be as quick as digital. So that is the reason. Okay, thank you. Right. So moving on to Delhi. Um, so just to talk about Delhi, I, I have been born and brought up in Delhi. Uh, I've, I'm 47 years old and I've spent, uh, obviously, the time I've spent is in Delhi. Uh, it's very... It's very important for a street photographer to shoot in his own city. You don't really have to travel the whole world to make pictures. You don't really uh, have to feel it in your mind that, oh, I wish I, I could go to a place like Varanasi or New York or Tokyo for that matter to take pictures. If you, if you have the ability to see things, then you should be able to make pictures in your neighborhood. Uh, this, is, this is shot in Nizamuddin area in Delhi. Uh, I saw this lane, which is very, very, uh, you know, it's very deserted at times. So, and there are a lot of street dogs. So I had to really courage myself to enter this lane. And I saw, if you see, there are two windows and that, that kind of attracted me. It felt like those, there are two eyes which are looking at me. And when I saw this woman crossing by, it looked like a face appearing to me. Uh, so that's what was the reason I took the shot. And then this, uh, so this is from a place, uh, it, is, uh, it is a bus stop in Delhi. Uh, I really want to talk a little bit about this bus stop because I've been shooting at this place uh, from past, I would say eight to nine years, uh, same place, same time, I, I go there at 8.45, uh, 7.45, and I leave that place at 8.45. So one hour of shooting every day at this place whenever I'm in Delhi. Uh, and I'm working on a book from this place. Uh, 
I could have done the book by now, but it's just that uh, I'm too uh, attached to this place to leave this place. Uh, so you will see uh, some images from this bus stop. This bus stop is uh, near to the Lotus Temple in Kalpaji. So giving you the shot. I saw this woman was applying oil in her ear and the minute she stretched her hand, uh, it gave me a shot. And also the crow on the left was just a bonus. So these are the street kids uh, in Delhi. Uh, there is a place, I think everybody's familiar with Jama Masjid, but there are also back lanes of Jama Masjid where uh, there are a lot of street kids. Uh, they, they, they're there and they, uh, these are kids of uh, people who have you know, local markets on Sundays behind this uh, Jama Masjid area. So these kids, when, they have, when there's a market going on, uh, these kids tend to play and they make, uh, they always make a fancy shot. Then this, this guy was selling toy guns. He's not trying to kill anybody. So when I saw this guy uh, raising the toy guns, it felt like that he's in command of the whole scene and he's gonna shoot everybody. Uh, so that's, that's why I took this picture. In Delhi, uh, there, are, there is a government education, there's a government schools and there are private schools. So the government schools, they for, so it's for boys and it's girls. So the boys school, the government school, it starts in uh, late afternoon, which is about two o'clock. So before that, these kids, they tend to uh, just leave home at about maybe 12, 12.30 and try to just play in the playground. So I saw this kids had a you know, book which had a giraffe at the back and I saw these kids playing on the swing and it looked like uh, there are giraffes everywhere. It's, um, I like to shoot kids a lot. Uh, they're full of energy and they, uh, they create a good dynamics in the frame. This is from the bus stop I was talking about. And this is uh, from a playground. Uh, what I uh, felt was uh, there, there were two kids on swings and uh, I just felt that kids being kids, they, the energy is same and I wanted to combine both of them into one. So if you'll see, it looks like one kid, it looks, but there are two kids and the posture, the dynamics it gave me uh, really made the shot to me. and. Uh, People at the back, they are just complimenting the whole scene. So these are what the, you'll be surprised to know that they're playing with toy cameras, which, uh, you know, there's a seller who, uh, they're, they're very, very cheap. They should be about, uh, I think, uh, uh, you can get three for one dollar or something. And uh, so people who are, these, these guys are travelers, they're tourists to Delhi and they, uh, they, they find something like this for the first time in Delhi and they want to see through it. Uh, so these uh, little toy cameras, they have slides which show you the uh, most important places in India, something like Taj Mahal or Lotus Temple, or I would say different cities, different uh, unique places of India in these slides. Then again, I, I like playing with the light and shade a lot. So these are the barber shop in Delhi. So I like the, the mirror here. Uh, wanted to create that kind of uh, tension in the frame and obviously create a window also between the hand that I could see that guy. And you can see the Lotus Temple in the background. This is inside a Jama Masjid. All these shots have been taken before the lockdown. So So I always like compelling compositions where there is a rhythm, there's a flow, and uh, the viewer becomes a part of the composition. 
And then I also like to take pictures of dogs a lot. This image was not taken on monochrome, but this is one of uh, the images which I uh, converted into black and white uh, because uh, this, this image speaks more to me in black and white than color. Uh, but I think, uh, I don't know if I'll keep this in black and white for long. I, my vision is predominantly color. This is Jam Masjid. There is, uh, they're sitting on the roof. So these were the black and white images uh, from Delhi. Now, if you have any questions from the black and white images, please go ahead and I'll move on to the color one, which is, that's why I said my Delhi. Jacqueline, uh, are there any questions? The questions are more general, I think. Uh, right. Uh, there's a question asking how are, how, are, how are Indians, are they friendly when the stranger brings a camera in front of them? Uh, yes, I would like to see these, all these uh, genetic questions are also very important because I'm sure people want to come to India and want to shoot. Yes. Um, people in India are very, very friendly. If you are taking a picture of somebody, there'll be 10 other people who would try to come into your frame. <laughs> so there is no problem. Uh, you'll be, you'll have a, a celebration in India shooting. It, in, in, to shoot in India is actually a celebration. So there is no problem coming to India and shooting. Uh, people are uh, warm. Uh, normally, Asians are okay anywhere in the world. You take pictures of Asians, it's fine. But uh, you have to be a little more careful when you uh, go to, uh, you know, I would say if you're going to Europe or New York, then you really have to be careful. Mm, okay. Any other questions? Um, not on Delhi, but more, more. Mm. All right, so more if the questions, so let's, let's keep it for the last uh, session. Okay, okay. But on Delhi, there's one question. How, how long did you have to wait for that dog, dog shot, for the tail um, to be in line? <laughs> so uh, in line, so I, I spent about uh, seven to eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> dogs, you know, when, when you see a dog or when, you, when you're approaching street dog, then you have to be equally careful also that he doesn't bite you. <laughs> Normally, uh, you know, they say that if you haven't been bitten by a, a street dog, then you're not a street photographer till that time. But I, uh, I've been bitten by a dog, but I, I got vaccinated. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I spent about 10 minutes and uh, that dog was over friendly. He was coming as close as possible to the camera because I think uh, he really wanted to get a picture click. But then when he got bored of me then, and he turned back, then that is how the picture happened. Okay, okay we'll address the questions, the others are later then, uh, during the right. Q&A. Thank you. Right, okay. Now this is the color version of my Delhi. Um, as I said, there is, there is a, there's a very positive energy flowing in Delhi. Uh, I saw these uh, kids, again, this is the Nizamuddin area. Uh, and swings, everybody, they come together as a community. Uh, this is um, a predominantly a Muslim-dominated uh, area, but there is nothing like that kids only from one community play in one community. There is, there is no problem as, a, as such. So anybody from any part of the world, please come uh, to Delhi, visit Delhi. There is nothing like that we have segregated uh, religions. We all play and stay together. Uh, this is, so there is, there is a mystery which I wanted to create in this picture. They are actually jumping into a step 12. Uh, and which is, if you'll see, uh, that step 12 is almost about, uh, I would say 30 feet from the top. And uh, in the summers when they want to beat the heat, they all try to jump from this height. Uh, that guy who's standing on the top, it made me feel that, he was in control and he was guiding people to jump and throw. So that was uh, more like uh, uh, what I've witnessed in that scenario and tried to create that moment. This is the toy camera, which I was talking about earlier. And uh, people are so crazy that everybody wanted to buy that camera. So the echo, even that kid in the window of the bus, he created that echo and uh, 
that's why I took the shot. So they say that um, you know photographs are painting of light. I I started doing photography because uh, uh, painting for me was taking too much time, and I wanted to paint with my pictures. I have a big influence of painters in my pictures. Uh, this image is actually uh, you know I was uh, inspired by Caravaggio's uh, work, uh, who's a very famous painter, and he likes to play with. Uh, light and shade, which is also called chiaroscuro, and there was a stark light which was falling on this person's face. Uh, now, how is this falling? How come the light is so filtered and falling? You see there the shadow of people who are standing. So they were actually blocking the light, and uh, the minute one of the person was moving in such a fashion, the ray of light just fell on the eye, and I took the shot. I spent about ten minutes here just to get that light on the eye. Um, and I made about, I think, uh, eight to 15 shots here, just to get that light. All right, so this is Old Delhi area. Uh, this guy is a fruit uh, vendor. Uh, you can see all sorts of colorful fruits. And also, uh, I, it's a morning time. It could have been a shot, but uh, without the birds, it won't be complete. I, it feels like there are two sections that's divided into two sections and also the wires hanging on the top. Uh, they, they are cable wires, which used to happen. This, this shot is about, I think, seven years old. And uh, when there were enough wires on uh, the pillars, which were hang, hanging like that, not anymore though. Again, uh, big influence of painters. I, I'm painting with light here. Uh, two sections divided into dark and light. And here, um, the echo of people just wearing yellow color. This is inside Jama Masjid, which is Asia's biggest mosque. Uh, there is also what we, as photographers, we have to realize that we are documenting culture and what we are shooting today is going to be holding value, let's say, after 20 years. Um, this uh, image, it is uh, now there is a fence and people can't come to this side of the frame and shoot both the sides of Jama Masjid. Uh, there, there is a dip which is about 30 feet on the left side. So I'm, my one leg is on the left and one leg on the right, and I'm creating that mystery. Now, this shot, it was a mystery for me because that kid, it felt like it was a toy and everybody is just uh, in their own world. And this kid, he's just lying or maybe waiting that somebody uh, is trying to pick him up. So it, is, it also said a lot about the whole world to me. Uh, it made me feel that when a kid is, kid is born, he's all alone. Uh, even with his family, he has to grow up in a world where nobody is going to pay attention to him. And he has to crave a platform for himself. And that is what he's coming into. Uh, but do you think he's a kid who was just lying there? No, it wasn't like that. Uh, there was the mother who was sitting on the left side with another kid. And that kid just ran out of that frame for the ball which he was playing with and the mother ran after him. And I just created that moment where it felt that it was that kid was alone. So for me, street photography or photography for that matter is it just a lie which lies behind the truth. So the truth was there and but I created a lie and I made it very subjective or open for very subjective interpretation for the viewer to read it. Um, so, you know, I, it's till the time you don't come to India, you don't, you will never realize that people will stand on the buses also in dry clothes. Uh, this is a very unique bus stop and, uh, that is why I've been addicted to this place. Um, so I always like echo of forms, echo of things which are happening. And, uh, I try to create images with that. And then, uh, you know, juxtaposition is another 
favorite of uh, my intensity of work, what I like to play with. Uh, it just felt like he's that, uh, you know, that guy was not even aware that he's holding a newspaper which had a big face. And I tried to make that face attached to that scooter guy. And then the light, and people like to play, kids like to play carom board. And this is during the monsoon, um, you know, the skies get so brilliant. This is from the bus stop again. Um, these are the street dogs. I saw this uh, shadow of the dog on the wall and uh, the dogs at the back. It kind of made that mystery that where is this uh, larger than life dog coming into the picture. And uh, then this, this dog just getting friend zone. So these are the images, the color images from Delhi. So if you have any questions from these images, please feel free to ask. Jacqueline, is there any question from Delhi? Jacqueline, hello. Uh, no, no, uh, not not again. Uh, uh, the question is mostly more more general. Uh, so All right. maybe okay. maybe we'll leave it to the to the end. Sure. All right. So these are the two cities which I've spoken about. Now moving on to the third and final city, which is Pushkar. Uh, so Pushkar is a city in uh, Rajasthan. Uh, it has uh, two very very important things. One is the Brahma temple, which is the only Brahma temple in the world. And secondly, there's the there's a largest kettle fair, which happens here in the month of November. Um, I've been visiting Pushkar from the past, uh, I would say, eight years, and I've been making pictures here. And it has always made me feel different in this place. This is, uh, the, the light in this place is very unique. It gets the, it's get a kind of filter. So I saw these kids playing and the shadows it created was very, very intriguing. There are, these are the back walls of the streets because I straight away didn't want to go to the kettle fair and show you the images of, uh, you know, camels or kettle. I also wanted to show you the pictures of people who live here. So just before the fair, this is, I went a week before the fair was about to begin and they are setting up big pandals. And uh, the intensity was, it was just overwhelming how these guys, they spend uh, days, in fact, months before the festival to bring it up into life. This is during the festival. Uh, um, so there, there is a cultural meet which happens. Uh, it is so different parts of Rajasthan, different, I would say, uh, small towns of Rajasthan, they come together and perform. So I saw this uh, kid who was trying to uh, scream at another person, but it appeared that as if the kid was trying to eat up all the horses uh, and that made a picture for me. And then, uh, as I told you, I like buses a lot. So I went to, I made this uh, effort and I went to the bus stop in Pushkar. And uh, you'll see that a lot of funny things which happen around. And then, you know, there, there was a Ferris wheel at the back and this guy, he, he looked like, as if he was the turbinator. And uh, so I, I got myself in such a position that I created that whole uniqueness. And that lady which turned back uh, just made a picture for me. Then there is a dragon which is about to eat that person who's trying to climb the electricity pole. And these are the kettles which are in Pushkar. 
um, I, I always look for a unique perspective where I show the world the things which they haven't seen the way they could be seen. Uh, I like to uh, create that mystery how some animal could be larger than life and could be protecting all the other animals, but that's my subjective interpretation. Uh, here, uh, what I created was I wanted to use the legs as windows so that I could place these camels in between. Then, as I said, that I'm I like creating echoes or playing with forms. Uh, these females were dressed up into red. I never. I didn't make an effort to speak to these people. I normally avoid talking to my uh, subjects and frame because I feel that if I talk to them, I'll alter the scene. So to make street photography as pure as possible, I try to avoid having conversations with people. I don't, uh, you know, try to alter the scene and just play with whatever is available. So this is, uh, so there is a pandal which they put up and they keep their horses or camels. So I went inside and I tried to see the world, how an animal could be seen outside. So I made a shot how maybe a camel, let's say inside the pandal would have looked at the world or maybe a, a buffalo. then you know you'll see the uniforms um, or maybe i would say the attire which females wear in rajasthan is totally different from other cities but in india the the best part is that in every five miles the dialect of people changes and at every 10 15 kilometers or miles the way they dress up changes so this is uh, i saw these old tribal uh, you know Young females, but old tribal tradition, uh, they were just uh, wearing these uh, clothes, which were just, I, it made me that they were meant to be taken, the picture. And also that uh, unique face at the back uh, with the eye made this picture for me. Then this, uh, I always like to create this tension in a frame where reality meets something which is very, uh, I would say, it's very dreamy, it's, it's surreal. Uh, I felt that they both were trying to scream and they were both trying to reach out for each other. And then finally, this is the shot which I really like from Pushkar and uh, these are, this is a, my, uh, you know, humble uh, shots from all these cities. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be happy to, to answer all these questions. So I, let me just stop sharing. So I hope you enjoyed the pictures and if you have any, any questions, if you have any, uh, anything to ask, I'm, I'm right here. There's a few questions, uh, um, yeah. uh, but I think uh, we also want to to mention to um, the participants here about the workshop that we plan to have uh, right. next Sunday. Um, so, so basically, this is um, uh, this is a, a workshop on visual and composition that that Vinet will be holding with us. Uh, for participants, uh, interested participants, please contact uh, your respective markets. Uh, we have a few. Um, we have a few markets uh, present in tonight's session, so the details are at such. I think each market has already shared um, locally. Uh, please do, do not hesitate to, uh, to to let us to let us know. Okay, so a few questions uh, uh, we have here, uh, uh, Vinay. One of them right. uh, is uh, since you use an MD and you can't review or preview your shots, do you shoot right. with auto or manual exposure? Uh, always manual. See, all the cameras, a beat like or any camera in the world, a uh, camera has its own IQ. 
but being a photographer then you should override uh, the camera and you should try to expose manually always because uh, you know at times you want to show how creativity can override uh, the exposure sometimes you need to expose it for the highlights where the camera will realize that it has to expose for the whole scene so i always expose uh, manually okay so if there are questions that are overlapping each other we'll just we'll just uh, we'll just hand we'll just take that's that's fine i'll be happy to answer overlapping questions also okay. as many times as you want <laughs> Just regarding the workshop is. sorry regarding the workshop yeah. which you mentioned if anybody has any question about the workshop also please feel free to ask so this workshop i'm i'm going to just uh, elaborate a little bit i'm going to talk about how to make the compelling compositions and also i'll be showing some contact sheets that how to reach a particular shot so that is what we're going to do uh, i'll i uh, this this workshop is totally or i would say is special for people who want to get into vision rather than knowing the complexity of the camera it will be more of uh, your vision not about the tool okay thank you there's a comment saying that i think it's very hard for me to get a layering picture using only range finder or m10d your skills are mm -hmm. amazing sir uh, thank you we have a question from from dave from scotland wow uh, Hello from Scotland. Can I ask Vinet, when taking pictures of the children, do you have any issues? In the UK, where obviously it isn't illegal to take photographs in public, I can see if I was taking picture of groups of children, I may be approached by parents or police. Right. That's a very interesting. That's, that's what uh, the, I was me making a comment earlier also, that in India, there is no problem. Uh, parents don't have an issue. Uh, you don't really have to take permission in India to take a picture of a kid. Uh, if it's if the person, uh, so the laws. Every country has different laws. In India, there's a law that in on a in a street place or if it's a um, it's a public space, then you can make pictures. You really don't have to take permissions. Uh, whereas in Europe uh, and US, uh, the laws are very strict, uh, and especially with the kids, uh, you really uh, you can't even enter a playground if you're not with a kid you know not escorted with the kid uh, so uh, europe is very tricky and us is also very tricky but i would say uh, if you have to make pictures of kids and get that dynamics going and the energy flowing then india is the place i i don't think there's a problem in indonesia also if you take pictures of kids and not also in singapore for that matter or uh, thailand for that matter i've i've made pictures and there's not been a problem thank you uh, the question about foreigners receptive to foreigners taking pictures of them i think you answered that earlier uh, yeah it is I, I would like to add on i would okay. like to add Sorry. on um, a, so in india there's you know there's a lot of tourism in india and we uh, there is no problem that uh, you'll be stopped for taking pictures or somebody is going to tell you that okay i'm going to throw a case at you nothing of that sort uh, in india smile goes a long way you smile at people and they smile back and i think that's the case everywhere in the world uh, you just have to it's it's also like you know when you're walking on the street uh, there's certain dogs which you have to be careful about that they don't bite same as the people in anywhere in the world you know you look at them and you know that this guy is going to approach you negatively so you have to be a clever traveler nothing else Okay. Uh, question. Next question is: What made you choose to use a range finder as your photographic tool of choice? Sorry, can you repeat that? What I made you choose to use a range mm -hmm. finder as your photographic tool of choice? So, uh, why a range finder? So this what, is yeah, what this is also a very interesting thing to tell everybody. So I. Uh, People who are not using Leica, I, I'll also this is going to be very helpful for them. Um, it is it is a frame like this. If you if you look at the whole world from any camera, this is the world. If you look from a rangefinder, this is the frame. So you know what is coming in and what is going out. So in photograph, you there are times when you want to know 
what is coming into your shot that you have to press the moment. You don't have to lift your head above the frame to see what is happening around. The extra minute detail which you want in your frame is what happens with the range finder. Now, when did I decide? Uh, decide? I, it was, um, I've been shooting with Leica actually literally all my life. My dad had a Leica and I've been using it from the M6 times. But I did switch on to other cameras in between. I have shot with other brands also. Um, but I wasn't, the way I shoot, I, I firstly, I go too close to people. Uh, if I don't smell my subject, I don't take the shot. And when, mm. when you're that close, you really want to see what is coming into your frame or what is going out. To create that uh, you know, proximity, I needed to use that uh, kind of range finder. And that is what I realized that the range finder will work the best in my situation. And so it could be, I would say the serious thing is about eight years back, I haven't uh, shot on any other thing. I've been shooting on range finder for eight years. Okay. Uh, I think your photos give priority to dynamic movements and layering. How did you get the photos? Do you believe how in decisive? I? Yeah, how do you get the photos? The next question is, do you believe in decisive moments or are you a burst image shooter? Or am I a bus image shooter? Burst, burst image. Burst. Multiple All right, shots. so I'll start. Right, I'll start from the last one. Uh, if I was a burst image shooter, then I would have been making videos. And I would, you know, take a video, go back home and see which one is the best. And I would have made a print out of that. Uh, that is also one reason that you shoot with range finders because you, it tends to slow you down. You don't want to shoot at 10 frames a second. I've seen people shooting on different brands, I'm not naming them, where there is a possibility of shooting 20 frames in a second or 15 frames in a second. They'll just go and look at the frame and they'll say, oh shit, I missed it. How can you miss a frame with 15 frames in a second? That means you weren't ready for the frame. You weren't seeing it. I believe seeing is more important and making a shot when you when you are in the scene is more important than actually just going on the video mode. So video mode is a big out. I would encourage all of you or I would suggest all of you to see and then make a shot and don't shoot on continuous mode. Now, uh, secondly, how, which was the first question was, how did I get the shot, right? Uh, yes. How did I get the shot? Uh, you'll have to probably attend the workshop next Sunday and you will see how did I get the shot. It'll be very, very encouraging for you, it will be very, very uh, intriguing also for me to unveil, how did I get that shot? Uh, second question, second part was, do I believe in decisive moment? I think all of us believe in decisive moment. I haven't come across anybody who doesn't believe in decisive moment. Uh, it doesn't really necessarily mean that uh, you have to get a shot. You have to be a part of the shot. You have to visualize certain shots. For me, uh, you, you saw some maybe, let's say, 30, 40 images, but what you're not seeing that the 90,000 images, which I missed. So you also have to realize uh, you have to spend more time. You have to practice. And in the end, when you will get a result, it'll be very satisfying. Uh, I totally believe in decisive moment. I, want, I believe why street photography is that it is about temporariness. Uh, in that particular shot, a viewer should be able to know what happened before or what happened, what is going to happen after. It is also, you know, I, uh, it, is, it is like a movie. For me, the whole world is like a movie playing. And as a photographer or as a visual storyteller, I like to put a pause where I want to put a pause. And I take that shot. And when the viewer sees it, he should have the ability to press play. And when he presses play, all the characters come back to life. And that is what I like to do through my shots. So I believe in decisive moment. Okay, thank you. Now the next question goes back to that silhouette shot, uh, mm -hmm. which you showed. For the silhouette mm -hmm. shot, how did you manage to frame the person head so precisely within the mouth of the silhouette? So I, precisely what? I did what? How did you manage to frame the person's head so precisely within the mouth of the silhouette? Right. Um, there's when when I told you that I'm shooting with 28 mm, 
Now, when you when you're shooting with 28 mm, the person who's right in front of your frame, he feels that he's never a part of the frame. Always try that. You can that makes you so, uh, you know, I would say, invisible. People don't see uh, you can make shot with that tiny lens and that close. Now, precision. Uh, when when I started photography about 25 years, 20, 28 years back, I was missing all the shots. It is practice. Today, if there's any sport, uh, you can complain uh, that you're not getting that sport right if you haven't practiced it enough. It is just practice. How did I get it? It is just practice. Uh, it is just simply asking uh, Messi that how did I sh he did you know he shot that goal. It is he's been practicing it a lot. And uh, let's for example today if I tell you to just go in the boxing ring and fight with the boxer, you will probably fail. You will probably lose. But if you keep practicing it for some time, then you will you will excel. It is to excel in anything you have to spend some time in uh, making shots. Thank you. Next question, when you decide to go to black and white, do you do it mm -hmm. after or before the shoot? Uh, so there is only one shot which I have decided after. Apart from that, all the shots have been shot on monochrome. Uh, why I included that shot? Because I've always uh, seen that shot in black and white. Uh, reason being, uh, the colors were totally influencing the scene for me. Otherwise, there is no afterthought. I don't really convert images into black and white uh, uh, because uh, I'm not against black and white, but it is just that I see the world. It is my voice which speaks in color. Uh, but people who uh, see things from uh, in black and white, it's very, very interesting to see their point of view. So it is just my voice which speaks in yeah. color. It is, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing against black and white, but there's nothing in favor of color. I think I can approach people uh, in color. Okay. So next question, with the low light shots you made here, did you use the Sumaron lens also? There is, uh, I, uh, I don't see there's any low light shot. There's always the ambience light, which I played with 5.6. I've always, all the shots which you've seen are in between F8 and F13. Uh, I've just shot with one lens. I don't, there is low light, if you mean, uh, that the light, uh, you know, which is just popping out. I expose for the highlights and make it look like that it was very low light. Okay. Uh, question from Jokja about safety. How uh, about the safety to camera, to carry camera in, in Delhi? Some photographers have stories about <laughs> getting robbed with their light gun. Is that true? Um, Some even covered so their lighter with black tape. Uh, so there are stories of things being stolen from the best cities in the world. And uh, there are all sorts of stories everywhere. Um, you just have to be clever. If you, if you, uh, you should not be inviting for uh, trouble in any part of the world. I've, I've heard same stories about different cities in Indonesia for that matter, or even, you know, in Vietnam or uh, so. It is, it is, you just have to be clever. There is no, you can't be robbed on the city. Uh, in, if you're walking, nobody's gonna steal the camera. It's nothing like that. It's very safe, but you just have to be clever. Don't uh, get into the areas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very general. Like there are cities, there are places in New York where you will not walk with the camera. So it's yeah. just, uh, so don't worry. Okay, next question. Do you use zone focusing or do you, use, do, you do hyperfocals? Um, I do zone focus. I only work with zone. Um, Hyperfocal is more for landscapes. Zone, if you want to do street, then zone focusing is much better option. Uh, but to also shoot on zone focusing, you have to know which zone do you normally work with. So it is, uh, you have to know yourself to actually get into zone focusing. Okay. Uh, how do you make creative photo in street photography and how to make frames in street photography? This, this is um, I think you just said that there is a, <laughs> that's what I said. That's a, they have to enroll for the workshop. <laughs> that's, that's this, you know, this is a very uh, 
different question that how do how does one make uh, pictures uh, pictures are not made firstly pictures pictures are all about you you make pictures nobody so when you when you realize about yourself when you when you know yourself better then you will take pictures which you like what is happening today is that people are trying to make pictures keeping in mind what people will like they are not making pictures what they think they like themselves so don't get into the rut of producing pictures which you feel that somebody else is going to like make pictures which you like and i think you will make much better pictures okay thank you so miss eva the the recording will be uploaded uh, to our like facebook page uh, in the next few days maybe you can extract it there maybe jacqueline can post the uh, the, the facebook address perhaps so the, so whoever that wants to extract the recording uh, can do so in the next few days okay next yeah. next question hmm? next question uh, what mm -hmm. do you what do you think about shooting without peeking at the viewfinder to make it discreet or is that something you also do um so is is the question that shooting from the hip i i don't shoot from the hip um uh, that if you're saying that I, if i don't look into the uh, viewfinder i always make a shot looking into the viewfinder uh that's why you know i i feel that the eyes are close to the brain for a reason if if eyes because that's how the eyes give signal to the brain uh if eyes were much quicker on the hand then the eyes would have been here we've been evolved to see from things here if you shoot from the hip or from below then i feel uh, you're wasting too much time you're not responsive you're not quick enough but some people they practice a lot from shooting from the hip and they can excel but i don't shoot i like to see what i'm seeing or what i want to show so i look from my eyes a lot okay. in fact i just look from my eyes okay thank you uh almost all the photos are taken at the perfect moment what the have the photos been planned or they were just moments that you found on the spot <laughs> this is very interesting uh, they they all just uh, been witnessed uh, i i witness shots i don't plan my shots if i had to plan shots and i would have been into uh, let's say food photography or product mm -hmm. photography um, or doing something in the studio uh, that is also i want to add on that uh, you if i'm showing you 40 shots which are on perfect time you're at least mis missing 400,000 shots which i didn't get in 28 years if i would have got two shots in a year in 28 years then it would still be 56 perfect shots so just i would suggest all of you when you're stepping out now aim for just two shots in a year you will get perfect shots but what is happening nowadays is that everybody steps out with a camera he feels that he wants to come back with a winner it doesn't happen like that winners don't happen in a day Uh, for winners you'll have to spend years okay thank you the next question some of the photos are composed with a large person in the foreground with the background also in focus what mm -hmm. aperture do you use and do you use f13 or f6 f13 or f16 uh, 28 is very good for uh, sumeron especially is very good for handling these kind of situations uh, i uh, really like to work with it because it works like a point and shoot for me uh, f16 f13 and i just have to visualize the shot i just mm. have to press the shutter um, so uh, i uh, photography is only about two decisions where to stand and when to press the shutter and when i've set my camera on a particular setting then i don't have to waste my time thinking about looking going into the menu and that's why this is another reason that i, I shoot with like a lot because everything is very handy it's in my hand I don't really have to some camera companies you really have to get into the menus and look for something and fiddle with something I don't do that setting I work with fixed setting see it and shoot it What metering do you use for street photography and what is the most uh, used I'm, lens uh I've answered that 28 mm uh metering I'm I'm exposing everything manually so I don't really uh, work with matrix or spot uh when it's uh, when it's highlight i expose for the highlights uh it's the metering is brain metering i would say practice again <laughs> again 
Okay, from Padiki, with post-COVID-19 new norm of social distancing, how do you think street photographies will be? Do you, do you right. see is, we will do it in different styles? This is, this is a very interesting question, and I was hoping that this pops out somewhere. Um, yeah, things will change, you know, for a person like me who used to go very close to people, and I, I used to be very proud by saying that if I don't smell the person, I don't shoot it. But I don't know, post-COVID, how close will I go to people? But it is also uh, a very interesting point uh, that all of us should realize that it will have an impact on our styles of photography also, which is a part of evolving. And when somebody is going to see uh, our pictures, we'll probably say uh, at BC, like before Christ, it's going to be before COVID also to some shots. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are two things, mask and uh, hand sanitizer are going to be two things which a photographer is always going to be walking with or any of us is going to be walking with. Uh, Indians, uh, in per se, you know, I've seen, uh, I used to believe that they will not follow the mask and, uh, you know, various rules, but they're following it very strongly. So if we are following, I think the whole world is following the practice of social distancing and everything. Uh, there is what people used to shoot with uh, 35, uh, they should be okay. But with 28, I think I'll have to step back a little bit. Uh, but I'm hoping things will get okay and it will come around. It's just that the photography style is going to change for a year, for sure. Um, you will be, uh, as street photographers, we'll have to be, we'll have to evolve a little bit more. We'll have to talk to ourselves a little bit more and uh, work out the scenes in a different way uh, i think we we'll, uh, i'm i'm still pretty okay because i shoot uh, animals a lot um, and i'll be okay but if you're shooting uh, humans a lot then you'll have to maintain some distance uh, but it is going to be interesting to see how a person how you a photographer evolves himself out of it i i would say that things will change uh, let's say I, I can't say positively or negatively, but things will change in photography, especially yeah, street photography. So something good will come out of this. Oh, for sure, always uh, be positive and it will come out. Next question is, uh, I think you answered that about focusing. So you usually zone, you, you usually use zone focusing, right? Not, not so That's much right. hyper focus. Right. Okay. That's right. so it's an in interesting question. Yeah. Greetings from Cambridge. I'm a student photographer and interested in street and documentary photography. Could you give me one mm -hmm. wisdom you want to share? Uh, if, if it's just about one wisdom, I'll tell you that believe in yourself and be yourself. And everybody else is taken. Uh, if you try to imitate somebody else's work of art, uh, then you are just being a secondhand copy of somebody who's already been there. Uh, if you can create original content, uh, talk to yourself a lot, uh, create images which you like, not thinking somebody else is going to like it. So be yourself and believe in yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any, well, I think you answered this one too. Do you have any advice for street photographers to shoot on streets during this COVID-19 time? Um, wear a mask. That is a must. <laughs> and. Uh, that is the most important thing. Uh, photographer, see, if, uh, if you are a street photographer, uh, the whole thing that you should have in your mind that you have to be alive to look at the pictures which you made. So you have to be intelligent while making pictures. Maintain social distance. Uh, please uh, listen to the laws or please listen to uh, what your government is saying or suggesting. Uh, if once the situation gets okay, I believe it's just a matter of time. Uh, we have to just hang in there for two, three months. Use this period. Use this period in learning. Use this period in uh, really looking back at the images which you've shot and see where you were going wrong. I think uh, we've been blessed with this time in a positive way to actually sit back and understand ourselves. We were in a rut of making pictures. And this is not only about photographers. This is for anything. We were just in a rut. We were making things. We were just running behind things. Now, life has given us a pause to think and realize things about ourselves. So use this time positively, and it is going to help you in further decision. But if you must step out and make pictures, uh, have some distance and be, be intelligent. Thank you. Uh, 
next question, you said you didn't like to talk to the subject. Is there any reason why? Mm -hmm. Because normally in street photography, we, we, we need to send greetings and smile and agreement to the subject, I guess, of being the pictures taken. Uh, so I, I consider myself as a thief. I, I like to steal moments. And if I mm. let the person know, then I've already altered the situation. I, I, I witness a scene from a distance. And when I feel the scene is ready, when the shot is ready to be taken, then I enter the shot and make the shot. And that is what I do. So I don't, I don't really converse with the person because it alters the whole scene. And I don't like oh. to alter the scene. Okay. Who are your favorite photographers? And what country do you think uh, is the best place for shooting street other than India? Other than India, all right. <laughs> uh, if I didn't hear the question completely, India would have been the first answer for sure. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you've not been to India, you're not a photographer as yet. Uh, street photographer per se. Um, all right, so let me uh, start answering from the second question. The city which I really like is, uh, I like New York a lot to shoot. I like uh, Istanbul a lot to shoot. The light is very, very good. Mm. And coming back to the first question, what was the first question? Sorry, well, well, who that? are your favorite photographers? Oh, wow. Uh, that is a very um, tricky question. And uh, if I name some, the other one is going to get angry. Uh, I, but I also would say that I'm, I'm very, I'm, I take inspiration from painters. Uh, mm. I, I love, I, I, I look at work from everybody. Uh, I really enjoy their work. I really enjoy their voice. It's like uh, how people sing different tunes. I like their tunes, uh, but the composition, I've learned it from the painters. I've, uh, I've learned the whole, uh, I would say, photography point of view is through painters. Okay. And uh, uh, the way they see light, and the, if you'll ask me who are my favorite paint, painters, then I would say I like uh, Renoir. I like uh, Degas, I like um, Caravaggio, I like Monet, Mane. So impressionist painters uh, per se, and but also uh, to see, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big uh, sucker for limbs with the hands. So in pictures, in photography, I don't see this as a hand, I see this as a hand. So I've learned that from Michelangelo a lot, uh, how he puts a lot of influence and lots of character into the hand. Uh, so postures, and uh, limbs from Michelangelo and light from, I would say, Caravaggio. And if you'll see uh, the surrealism, then, uh, and impressionism is from Renoir, Degas, Monet, Man. Okay. Last question for the session uh, we have here. When, right. when, you, when you say you shoot manual, do you also select the ISO manually? And what about uh, white okay. balance? Right. White balance is always auto. Uh, you know, I don't really work or touch that part. There are three decisions which one has to make with the camera. ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. Uh, now, to just to make things very easy, uh, I always freeze the ISO at 800. Always. Even if it's bright daylight. Because I don't have to make that decision. This which is the aperture, I try to make it at F13 and I play it like F13 and F16, depending on the light, or F11. And the shutter speed, if I see that the, if I'm seeing a lot of commotion, then I'll freeze the shutter speed at one by 500. And then I will play according to, you know, if I need F13 or F11 or F16. I try to position myself in such a way where I take the least amount of decisions in street mm. photography, so ISO, is always 800 for me, be bright daylight, so that I have the ability to make or push the shutter speed to 500 to 1000. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vidal. I think we, we finished Thank our, you so much. Our, our questions. Uh, any other questions? Right. Uh, you have a few more minutes to, to include it in. Otherwise, um, uh, maybe is there anything else you want to elaborate about the workshop? So uh, this workshop is going to be for a little bit advanced level. Um, I will not be telling, I will not be guiding about the cameras. Uh, I, I will talk about vision and how people can improve their vision and voice in street photography. So it'll be a one and a half hour session about that. 
um, there is going to be a, a small lecture on uh, how to compose scenes and make compelling composition in uh, the given situation and also how to tell stories from your pictures. Okay. Okay then. Thank you very much Vinod, for your time. Thank you so uh, much. Thank, thank, thank you, you everyone. all. Thank you for the time. Again, uh, the session we will post it in our, in our Facebook page. In the next few days, you can, you can go in and extract it uh, for your own record and replay again, perhaps. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, so thank you, Vinod. Uh, have a good evening. Thank stay you. Help, stay healthy, uh, stay safe. I, I, I would uh, really take this opportunity to thank uh, once again to all of you for being so patient and listening to uh, what I've been doing. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a thank you. good weekend. Uh, yes. Hope to see you here when, when things are better. Yes, I, I would love to be there the minute it gets okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Good evening. Bye-bye.